Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship. Uh, here at Northminster, super glad that you're here. Thanks for braving the cold and all that snow. I hope you made it through the week nice and safely. Um, and uh, so just welcome to worship. Welcome to the worship of the living God this morning. Uh, just a reminder, keep, we're going to keep our masks on for now over our nose and our mouth everywhere we are in the building. And then if you could also fill out that um, card as you came in. There's a, there's a connect card. If you just put your name on there, if you know we have all of your correct information, that'd be great. But if there's other information that you know we need to be updated, or if you're new and you don't mean sh uh, mind sharing your uh, information with us, just helps us stay better connected with one another. It also means that we can pray with each other. So if there's some things that we could be praying, joining with you in prayer for, some concerns or something exciting, um, you can write that on the card and know that we will um, be praying about those things with you. So this past week, I was at our denomination's national gathering uh, in Texas. And so we are part of a denomination you probably know called ECO for short. It stands for the Covenant Order of Evangelical Presbyterians. Don't try to figure it out. It doesn't match. Um, and, uh, and every year, the, the, uh, the, all of the representatives from the, uh, other, the churches in our denomination gather somewhere. And every two years, we, have, we uh, include a business meeting with that, which, by the way, is not the most exciting part of the meeting, but there was not a lot of business to be done. But there's pre-conferences and breakout sessions and uh, a chance to connect with people in our denomination, and it was just a fantastic time. So thank you for allowing me to go and be with people in our denomination and in our presbytery, and uh, there's a great chance to learn more all about that. So if you go online, if you, if you just Google ECO National Gathering 2022, you'll find a bunch of resources online where you can watch some of the plenary sessions and the speakers. You can hear from our synod executive. You can see what's going on. And you can also email me if you want to hear more about what's going on. I can send you some information. I can tell you a lot about what's happening in our presbytery and the churches we're united with. You guys, ECO is a fantastic resource. Um, it's just a great um, body of other churches for us to be a part of and so glad that we're, uh, we're with them. Couple quick announcements. First, this Thursday, um, my Thursday night Bible study returns for adults, or I guess anyone else could come, but I'm super excited. We're going to start a uh, study of kind of different high places in the scriptures, different mountains. You know, God says, lift up your eyes to the hills, lift up your eyes to the mountains. Where does your help come from? Your help comes from the Lord. But the Bible also says this other weird thing it says, who could even ascend the hill of the Lord? And so there's this confliction, like what does it mean to want to go meet with God, but, but also be kept away from God in these different places in the scripture where we, see, where we see God's people going up to these high places to both be challenged and confronted and connect with the living God. We're going to learn about how that, what that has to do for us too. So you're totally invited. You're invited for one week or all of the weeks. If you want to just pop in one Thursday and see what it's like and hang out and learn some scripture together, you're welcome uh, on, a, on a weekly basis or just when you can come. And by the way, I'm going to offer that on Zoom too. So there's a, it's a potential for you just to, to call in from wherever you are. And if you need that link, you can just uh, email me and I will send you the link for the Thursday night Bible study. A week from today, February 13th, is our annual, uh, our annual meeting of the congregation. So following the 9 a.m. worship service, we will have a, a quick annual meeting of this congregation. And it's a chance for us to just kind of hear about what God has done in the past year and to do some business for the coming year. And so just mark your calendars and you want to be here for that next week. We do all these things because we represent God's love in the world, and we represent his love by building friendships, by being transformed by his word, and by caring for one another. That's who we are. It's in our DNA. That's what it means for us to be part of Northminster. Like I mentioned, I was in Dallas, and while you guys were getting a bunch of snow, I wasn't getting anything until the day after, and like this much ice fell. And you know what happens when like this much ice falls in Texas? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Everything stops, right? And people freak out. They don't have the resources to deal with it. Even a day later, a day and a half later, the whole place shut down. Everything was just in gridlock. It was turmoil. There were like regular updates on the TV about how the power grid was doing, right? All these like really interesting things because they just didn't have the resource to, resources to deal with the trouble that had come into their lives. I wonder if you've ever felt like that. You may have even felt like that this week. There may be something going on that no one knows about. There may be something going on that everyone knows about. You may be in the throes of, of struggle or illness or grief or worry or distraction. 
this may have been a hard week for you. And if it hasn't been a hard week for you, praise God, but you probably know what those hard weeks are like. And if you haven't even experienced that, you will know them to come. Trouble comes into our lives. But when we come to this place, we acknowledge together that there is one who has the resources to address our trouble. There's the one who promises peace and comfort and goodness, who has brought us into the fellowship of his son, that we could be together with him. And so when we come to this place, we don't just come for this kind of like distanced, separate thing from the rest of our life. We come here with everything that this week has meant for us. All the ways that trouble might have shut us down or given us, given us difficulty. And we come to this place and we say, God has the resources that I need. And that's the God we worship this morning. So would you stand and let's praise Jesus this morning. Let's sing, who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the you've done for me.
Cause you know just what we need before we say a word. You're a good, good Father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, sing. You are perfect. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways to us. And love so undeniable, hardly sink in peace, so unexplainable. I can hardly. who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Be seated, and let's pray. God, we do proclaim that you are good to us. You are our good Father. And so we come this morning um, with joy, knowing that you do uh, make us part of your family. And we want to proclaim that that's who you are, and yet we admit that our words can't sum you up. God, we know you're holy, but, but your holiness, your righteousness is bright, as a noonday sun, and so we can't see it fully. And we know that you're sovereign, but we know that your ways and your thoughts are not our ways and thoughts, and they're beyond us, and so we can't comprehend what you're doing. God, we know that you love us, but your love is so high and long and wide and deep that we just barely see the tiniest glimpse of the compassion and mercy that you have for us. And so, yes, God, you are a good father. Yes, we come to proclaim your holiness and your sovereignty and your love. But we also know we can't truly understand these things. And so, God, we thank you for your grace that invites us to meet you. Though we're imperfect, though we don't have it figured out, we thank you that though we are frail and uh, broken and see so little, you love us still. And so, Lord, we confess that our blindness and much of our brokenness is due to our own sinful, wayward hearts. We confess that we've looked aside from you to small, distracting things of this world. We confess that our hearts are often captured by our own desires in our own desires to have things our own way. We confess that even though we want to do things in a way that honors you too often, we can't and we don't, and so we hurt those we say we love and we withhold grace from those who most need it, and sometimes we even keep our own selves from you.
But Lord, we thank you that you know all, know all of this. And you know, you know all of this and so much more about us, and yet you love us still. And you've sent Jesus to make a way through the atoning sacrifice of his cross that we might be with you forever because of his work. And so God, I pray that though our vision is limited and we are prone to wander, that your Holy Spirit would empower us to live lives that glorify you. God, I ask for those gathered here, those online, those who belong to the fellowship of Northminster and those who belong to other churches and other places. God, I ask that you would make us settled in our knowledge of your love for us. God, would you make us settled in our, our knowledge of the hope that you've given that might sustain us when things are hard or our immediate circumstances are difficult. God, I ask that you would give us peace that we would know what it means that we belong to you, that we would come to you and we don't understand what's going on. God, would you give us diligence to serve others faithfully? Would you give us generosity in our giving of our time and our resources? Would you give us a gentleness and a tenderness as we interact with other people? God, would you give us faith to keep trusting you when things seem so frightening or difficult? And God, would you give us love love for you and for neighbor, love that others would see, love that points to you. God, I know that this is a challenging time for so many in our congregation. And so we pray this morning, especially for the Birke family. We ask for your comfort and peace and presence to be with them now. We ask your continued blessing all the hurt on the hurting and the ill and the grieving and the lonely among us. Would you make us instruments of your grace towards them, that they may encounter you in the presence that we provide? God, most of all, make us the ones who, through the power of your spirit, proclaim the goodness of God. Make us ones who know what it means to be part of you in your death and your resurrection. Make us ones who can know you in our limited vision. Make us ones who walk like Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, it's the time of worship service where the littlest ones get to head out. You're going to meet Mr. Curry and Mrs. Kerr um, back there at the door. Adam and Mary will be super excited to hang out with you today. So uh, third grade and under, you're going to um, go with them and head down and watch the end of your video today. The rest of us, we're going to stand and greet your neighbor and share your favorite winter Olympic sport. Let's stand and greet your neighbor. Share your, share your favorite winter Olympic sport. Continue in this time of worship. Oh. 
So this past week on Thursday, February 3rd, the stock price of the company previously known as Facebook Incorporated, it plummeted. In one day, they lost 26% of their value, some $251 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO and founder of the company, he personally lost $32 billion in one day. I was talking with my son Matt yesterday, and he helped to put that in perspective of just how much $32 billion is. Do you know that if you go back and if we make the uh, earliest assumption for the death of Christ, so the year 30, and we put that on Passover, which would have been uh, April 25th for us, if you go all the way back to there and you and you said that every day from that date until now, until February 6, 2022, if every day you received $43,000, you would still come up short by the tune of some $719 million. That's, $32 billion is a lot of money. I get nervous when I lose 32 cents. 
It's hard to imagine losing that much. Today, we're going to talk about something much more valuable, of such greater importance. Something that I'm not saying that we have lost, but maybe we just haven't paid it enough attention recently. Or, or maybe we've let it uh, get swept away in our lives by other distractions that have been taking place. Or maybe we've hidden it behind some other priorities. But there's something that, that offers for us a greater enjoyment a, a greater opportunity to rely upon it and let it fill our lives. And so today we finish up our series that we've been called, calling Blessed, where we've been looking at uh, five different uh, New Testament passages, New Testament blessings, including today, that these are uh, little places in Scripture where the author has put forward to us, may God grant you, may God give you, may God show you His favor. And so for today, our passage is 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. It's such a small passage, we'll stay in our seats, but I encourage you, would you open your Bibles, and feel free to make use of one of the ones we provide in the row at home. If you have a Bible and you want to go grab it and um, uh, bring it so you can have it open before you, that would be wonderful. We'll also put it on the screen. The Word of God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. May God bless the speaking of his word and may God bless, may God show his favor among us as we come under his word today. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're, I, I'd like us to take a little time and look at the context of the passage and, and wrestle with our own context in light of the context of the passage. And then I, I, I'd like us to spend a little time looking at the blessing itself, and finally we'll end up with an implication that flows from the blessing. So first to the context. And again, in this context, which by the way, this is always a smart thing to do. If you're going to look to understand a certain set of verses, it's always good to understand its context. In, in the book itself, in that particular part of a book, maybe the whole book, the whole of the Testament, the whole of the Bible, we look at the historical and cultural pieces as well. But a good place to start is simply to move back up the passage, go back a number of verses and see what's taking place. Well, for us, let's turn our attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, and find what we see there. Examine yourselves, Paul writes. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. He's had this uh, uh, relationship with the Corinthian Christians that's been a little up and down. They've had some struggles along the way. In fact, his last visit was not an easy visit at all. And so here he's writing to them, and, and he calls them to examine themselves, to, to look inside. Now, he asks them, will you even find Jesus inside of you? And he asks the question in a way where he assumes that they will. But he holds it before them. Take a hard look. Examine. Pay attention to this Christ you have received. If we drop down to verse 9, um, we find the words, for we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. And here Paul is saying, you know, I don't mind being weak if it makes you strong. I don't mind being uh, spoke ill of. I, I, I don't mind if, if I'm the one who endures the, 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 the pain of, of all that's going on. I, I really want you to be strong. I don't mind being seen as the weak one. I want you to be strong in your faith. Um, and he goes, it's your restoration that we pray for. It's an interesting word. In fact, I think if you have a New International Version Bible, it'll say uh, perfection that, or, that, that, uh, or completion. It, it, this word means all of that, that you would be fully equipped, that you would be brought to completeness. 
your restoration, your being fully equipped is what we pray for. And then finally, this encouragement down in verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Aim for restoration. Aim for that completion, that being fully equipped. Apply yourselves. Make that, make that a priority in your life. I was uh, making use of a commentary this past week by Paul Barnett on 2 Corinthians. And when he sums up the, the challenges that the Corinthians were having in their church, he says that there were three big issues. And so as Paul is calling them, listen, examine yourselves, it's in light of these three big issues that were at play in their congregation. The way that Barnett puts it, he says the first one was that they were flirting with the other Jesus of the intruders. That there were these people um, with a Jewish background that were coming in and saying that they wanted to have uh, uh, more of an alignment with the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, the law of God. That they were flirting with this other Jesus. That they were not taking the Jesus that they had received when Paul had, had brought the good news to him, but they were reverting to kind of this hybrid of faith. I was... Uh, in a book this past week by uh, Tim Keller, and uh, he was making the, the point that uh, for preachers, but I think it's true for a lot of us, that, that we can have this tendency to either want to be legalistic, uh, where we make it all about law and following all the code, and that we want to be legalistic, that we would pound the, the pulpit, and we would point the finger, and we would demand a certain kind of behavior. Or on the other hand, that we would become what they call antinomial, um, uh, that we would be uh, uh, people that would say we're against the law, we're against having the law, and, and really it's just a, a law unto yourself, and you feel free to make your choices, that there are no boundaries. And, and maybe it's not just preachers, maybe we, a number of us can be like that, that if we tend to be more legalistic, we find ourselves judging other people a lot. That we just want to point a finger and, and hold people to a certain standard, even if we ourselves don't live up to that standard, but we point the finger a lot. Even in the name of Jesus, we can even call ourselves Christians saved by grace, and yet we can point the finger of saying, you need to behave differently. On the other hand, we can find ourselves going, you know, it really doesn't matter. In fact, the whole story of Jesus is so archaic, and, and we're just going to let people kind of go their way, and, and it's all good, it'll all work out, and we can become uh, against the law altogether. They were flirting with the other Jesus. Flirting with the other Jesus. They were also enmeshed in a Gentile lifestyle, according to Bar Barnett. That was another of their big challenges that was going on. Um, we might put that in a more broad way, that they were enmeshed in a worldly lifestyle. That they were letting the culture come in and they wanted to have, yes, Jesus, but yes, culture. And wanting to bring them together and again, being this dynamic of, yeah, we like Jesus and what he stands for, but we really like our culture and, and what it stands for. And bringing the two together. And that the third issue was that they, had, they were loftily, this is how Barnett put it, that they were loftily critical of Paul. Uh, and again, if we expand that, that they would be loftily critical of, uh, of Christ-centered teaching. Well, if that's what was going on in their context, maybe we would do well to look at our context. To what degree might we be engaging in the same practices today? Are we flirting with another Jesus? Are we tending toward legalism or anti-nomianism? Are, are, are we all about judging other people or just saying, "Ali, ali, oxen free and go do whatever you want? I love that in the Bible there are a number of places that provide ways and tools that we can examine ourselves by. And when it comes to knowing the Jesus of Scripture, there are so many different places we could turn to to go, wait a minute, if I examine myself, do I line up with the Jesus of the Bible? Is that the Jesus that I celebrate living inside of me? One of those places happens to be the Gospel of John. And he has those I am statements. 
Uh, and if we even just took the list of those I am statements, where he goes, I am the bread of life. The Jesus that we sense and know that lives in us as people who follow Jesus Christ. Do we have a hunger for him as the very substance that brings life? Not just a, a name, not just a, a past experience, but, but one who brings the substance that gives life every day for the whole of our life. Jesus said also that I am the light of the world. Is that the Jesus we have living in our hearts? Is that the Jesus that we have front and center in our lives? That, that this Jesus is the light of the world. There's not a second answer. That this, this is the Jesus meant for everybody. That he died on the cross for all people. And, and do we share Jesus in that way with others? Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the gate of the sheepfold. That he is the door. That, that he is the one who stands there protecting the sheep. And, and yet he's the passageway as well. And, and he's the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And that his sheep know him and he knows his sheep that the sheep know the sound of his voice and and he knows them is is that the jesus that we follow the good shepherd he said i am the resurrection and the life that he's more than just a ticket to heaven a means to an end but he is the resurrection himself he is the life himself when we examine ourselves when we test ourselves and the jesus we're following are we looking forward to a, 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 a return of Christ that brings the resurrection unto eternal life? That Jesus himself is that resurrection and that life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Is this the Jesus we find our lives built upon? If we examine ourselves, what do we find about our enmeshment in a modern American lifestyle? Clearly, we wouldn't be necessarily aligned with a Gentile, first century Gentile uh, lifestyle, so probably a modern American lifestyle. And by the way, this is, this is one of those areas where I'm always caught up, that, that my own journey with Jesus, that it's so easy and so uh, tempting to, to take the way of this world and, and to let it become uh, connected or, or even overcome the way of Christ and what Christ prioritized. And if we examine ourselves and our context, to what degree have we become enmeshed in the American lifestyle? Are we loftily critical of those who accurately represent Jesus? Whether it's an author we're reading or somebody in our life group or a Bible study teacher, and we hear it, we hear it, and we just dismiss it. The word comes forward about what Jesus is all about. And we go, that, that's not for me. I'll go with my own Jesus. The takeaway is, is this, that, that I think that, that there is such similarity between the context. That those, those three things can very much be at play in our culture, in our context, as they were in the Corinthian culture. That we can be drawn to a different Jesus. We can... Uh, be enmeshed in the world around us and the culture of the world around us, that, that we can be critical of those who actually represent the Christ of the Bible. And if that is true, then we need this text. If our context, to whatever degree, our context is similar to the context of, first, uh, of, of the Corinthian church in the first century, then we need this blessing. So let's talk about the blessing next. It turns out that the blessing that we're given here, like the Trinity, is both three and one. It, it has three things to it, and it has one thing to it. So let's start with the three. And in this, we, we, we're going to find hope and direction, but let's start with the three. The, the first of them is grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. By the way, just a little pause here. When we start talking about the Trinity, um, you probably, if you've been in a Bible study, you've probably heard this before, that the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Instead, what we find, and in, in, uh, this has been said, said by uh, others before, but what we find in the Bible are, are the raw materials of the Trinity. That we find a number of places where uh, even Paul can feel very comfortable talking about the grace of God or the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
in fact, even pairing them together, that, that there's a distinction, and yet there's some kind of amazing unity and connection between the Father and the Son. The raw materials that would then lead the church to understand what the Trinity uh, means, what the theology of the Trinity means. So Paul writes, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is his unmerited favor. We know that this grace is, is the grace that, that comes to us through Jesus dying on the cross. The forgiveness of our sins. That, that there was nothing we could do to earn our way to God. But that God's grace came to us. The very grace of Christ came to us and, and blesses us. It's something that's already true. In fact, if you've said yes to Jesus Christ, you have the grace. It was the grace of Jesus Christ that allowed you to say yes to Jesus Christ. It's already true, and yet we can pursue it. We can grow in it, that it can become the, the very way of our lives as well. And one day we know that that grace will, will blossom and, and, and reach its, its full effect on us, and, and that forevermore we'll be able to enjoy God's presence beyond this world. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. The second thing is the love of God. The love of God. I love the way that Paul writes this out here, that he would associate the grace with Jesus Christ, the love with God. It, it, it harkens even back to the, what we call the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God was always celebrated for his hesed, his, his loving kindness, his steadfast loving kindness, his mercy, his covenant commitment of loving his people, that the love of God would be theirs. By the way, it's an interesting way that Paul sets up the whole of the letter of 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn back to the very first chapter of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians begins uh, with first Paul mentioning his name and giving a couple comments about himself and mentioning the, the church in Corinth. But then in verse 2 he says, in in Watch what happens here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. In fact, even if we began back in two, I started in three. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So even there, the pairing of, it's the grace and peace from both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. This is the hesed. This is, this is the loving kindness, the steadfast covenantal loving kindness of God who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's the God who gives his love. The love of God be with you. And then thirdly, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Now here's a different thing taking place here. As one commentator put it, that, that in, in the grace of Christ, that's a, a, a thing. The, the grace of Christ is, is a thing that belongs to Jesus. It's his grace and he gives it to us. The love of God is a thing and, and God gives us his love. It, it belongs to him and he, and he shares it with us. The fellowship of the Spirit is a uh, uh, more of an abstract thing, and it's a participation. It's a communion that we would step into this relationship with the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit coming to us. Do you get the three? There's something distinct that Paul is, is mentioning that, and feels comfortable being able to say the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And yet, it's one. It's one those three things come together in that fellowship. Those three things, the grace, the love, the, the fellowship itself, it comes together in a communion of one. Let me share with you a, 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 an additional passage to this. This is from John's Gospel. It, it just gives you another example of how they were, uh, um, the early church was presenting the raw materials that would become our understanding of the Trinity. This is in John's Gospel, chapter uh, 14, beginning in verse 23. Jesus answered one of his disciples, If anyone loves me, that person will keep my word, and my Father will love that person. And we will come to him and make our home with him. The Father and the Son coming to the person 
and making their home in him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. What a picture. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We know, distinct and yet together one, there's a unity. It's three in one. Eventually they'll come to use words like one substance and three persons, but, but here we see the relationship being established. The whole of God pouring out his gifts on you, on me, on us. You know, there's this thing that takes place at stores for me. It's this thing where you go to the checkout line and they, um, uh, they ask this question, would you like to save 15% uh, uh, today? Now, I know in my mind that they're asking if I want to open a charge account with them, which I don't. But I always feel weird when they ask, would you like to save 15% today? No, I would rather pay the full amount. Thank you very much. And here, we have this offer. In fact, this is the implication. We have this offer. Christianity is fundamentally about a relationship. And God's offering this relationship full of the grace of Jesus Christ, full of the love of God, full of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Would you like this? Do we want this? This year, we're going to be asking a, a, a big question of what's next. And when we think about what's next, it, it's going to be connected to this relationship. We know that in this relationship that we have, because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of the love of God, because of the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that it is a relationship that is intimate and robust, life-altering, purpose-filled. And so this year as we ask what's next, in light of all the changes that have gone on, all the uh, gains and losses, the, the challenges of the pandemic, and what does ministry look like in our culture going next? Well, we can know that it will be, whatever's next will be based on the foundation of the grace of Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Whatever's next will have to involve pursuing and living out and learning more about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And whatever we hear and, and, and seek from God of what's next, letting God tell us and show us, we know that one day it'll have its completion that's brought about because of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. We began this morning talking about Zuckerberg. I don't want you to feel too bad for him. It turns out he still has $89 billion. And yet, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are richer still. You have been given treasures beyond comparison. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful that, that you would bring illustration to our own lives through the story of a church that existed some 2,000 years ago. That the very things that they would be wrestling with would align with some of the very things that we wrestle with. And that even better, God, that your answer to them through the words of Paul is your answer to us through the words of Paul. And God, to whatever degree we have allowed our connection with you to fall away, be hidden, that our lives would be full of distraction, would you help us examine ourselves? 
that the relationship we have with you, that, that we would uh, not resist that, that, that we would open ourselves to it daily, that we would welcome, that, that we would seek and want that blessing upon our lives, the full grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love that you want to share with us, the fellowship that you offer. We're thankful for the gifts you give. We're thankful for the gift of this meal that we'll celebrate together. We even ask that you would set aside the, these uh, very basic items, these, uh, this bread and this juice, and that you would use it in our midst, that our, our experience together would be a, a celebration, a, 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 a joy-filled celebration of communion with you. We give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. There's a place in Paul's letter to the Corinthian church that we know as 1 Corinthians. And in there he writes, um, in chapter 10, listen to these words here. This is um, chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. He says, uh, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? That word participation is the same word that we translated in the other passage as fellowship. Is not the cup of blessing a fellowship? in Christ is not the bread we break a fellowship a participation in the body of Christ this morning we celebrate this meal not just because it's a thing we do but because we have the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ if you said yes to Jesus you have the love of God if you said yes to Jesus you have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and so we participate together as one people, we have communion. And so when Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and broke and said, this is my body broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so remembering me. And he took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do so remember me. For whenever we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we proclaim his death, which is to say we also proclaim our new life. This meal is ready. We invite you to come forward that, that if you're not yet at the place where, where you've been able to say, Christ, I want to follow you. I receive your love. We ask that, that you would hold off on this meal until that time when, when that is true for you. As you come forward, we're going to invite you to come to the middle of the, of the room and, and then to come forward, there'll be a basket on each side and the person holding the basket will take the cup and uh, uh, the wa wafer and put it in your hands. If you go back to your seat, would you hold on that together that we might eat together as one people? It's ready. Uh, those who are serving, if you'd come forward and then let us follow and receive the meal today.
Let us share in the meal together, the body and blood of Christ. you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the gift of this meal, for the gift of your grace, the gift of your love, the gift of your fellowship. To you be all the glory. In Christ's name, amen. Today we have the opportunity to celebrate uh, our benediction together. We can offer it to each other. We'll do that through a song. We, when we began this series on blessing, there was a song we used, and um, Nathan and the praise team are bringing that back to us today as we take words from Scripture and we bless each other. So let me make a couple of comments just to, as we end our service so that we end with the blessing itself. First of all, thank you so much for being here. And we do hope that you know the love of God personally. If you have any questions you want to follow up with, would you reach out? We'd love to have those conversations with you. Maybe you brought a financial offering that you wanted to make part of your worship experience this morning. We have blue buckets on the, by the doors on the way out. and Feel free to uh, place it in there as an act of worship. Next Sunday is going to be our annual meeting of the congregation, which will occur right after this service. It won't last long, but we wanted to give you the annual report ahead of time. And it's been prepared and it's on the table as you leave this these doors this morning that you'll find it on the center table out there and we've pr provided a printed one one per family but there's also a link online in the email that went out this morning about worship there's a link to a digital copy of that as well and so now if you're willing let's stand and participate in blessing one another I'm going to invite you to take this posture of worship, just extend your hands out to receive this blessing. Let's extend our hands like this. Let's sing this. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Go in peace.